Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is an interesting fellow all the way from Ireland. His name is Jeff Castleton. He is a co-founder and principal at Castleton Consulting. He's an executive coach, a mentor, a vertical development consultant, advisor, fellow human being that's a great one <laughs> and he's always looking to live within the donut the sprinkle mm. one of course mm. he says i find purpose in helping others to develop their capability as holistic thinkers so together we can reinvent and redefine our collective relationships with work business and the planet or planet around us he's also the coo of the tech and technology and board advisor for by media he's a mentor for enterprise ireland and he's a graduate of one of my favorites indiana university in bloomington my home state go hoosiers <laughs> jeff glad to have you here yeah who's your right yeah yeah well it's my pleasure to be here zen thanks for the invitation it's good to see you again uh it's good to see you too and, and you know, there's all kinds of, of things that are popping in both our lives and the world simultaneously. And so part of what I'm doing in the exploration of that is looking at, okay, how do we connect? And one of the first places we live half inside and half outside. We're bereft of what's going on inside. So I think those are some of the conversations that are most poignant to have now, especially as we're emerging into some kind of new world order that we're not quite sure what it's going to be yet. So we're trying to affect it positively. Mm -hmm. so in that process, this, in your inner development, was there a time when you were younger or, or a teenager or someplace in there where you began to realize that there was something, there was a connection inside of you that um, was unique and special to you that maybe perhaps others weren't too aware of, nor did you know how to articulate yet? <laughs> yeah, that's a... Uh... Well, that's a really good question. That's a bit of a complex one, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I you know, I'm a cursory kind of guy, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I'd say, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, I think, I mean, if I look back at myself, I suppose there was always the, an inner drive to excel when I was a young person. I was, you know, reasonably intelligent, aware of the world around me. Um, and I think probably you know, what happened in school probably transferred into my work life as well. Um, so so like, oh, were you constantly challenging while. your own, I, I apologize. Um, mm -hmm. Were you constantly challenging your own ability to do or to be and do more? Yeah, it was, I mean, I suppose there was probably a bit of uh, competition with others, but mm -hmm. probably more of it was with myself, you know? How do I push myself? How do I, how do I get better? How do I do more, accomplish more? Um, oddly though, at the same time, I think there was always something in me that really valued fairness, a sense of equity. Um, and I, you know, like I, I grew up in a, in a city environment in a reasonably multicultural for, you know, 1970s America, a reasonably multicultural environment. Uh, then moved out to the country, lived in, you know, kind of a rural setting, sort of monocultural. Um, went off to the university, ended up in African-American studies of, of all kinds of disciplines. Um, was, you know, really interested in kind of this notion of how do people that seem the same as me, but there's obviously some difference. How do we have such a different experience mm -hmm. living in the same country, living in the same place? Um so I don't know. I mean, that was a kind of one of the things that was always rattling around in there early on. And I think when I probably got into university, I probably started to understand a little bit more of, you know, starting to see the world uh, through a different set of eyes, I suppose. Um, my my father committed suicide uh, when I was 17, right as I was going into university, um, which profoundly, I think, kind of shook me in terms of oh, my yeah. understanding. Yeah, like what yeah, what life's supposed to be like and what normal feels like and all these other kinds of things. Yeah, um, that, that's a, you know, on the one hand, it's a horrific experience to go to or go through. 
Mm -hmm. and yet, you know, as with all of those horrific experiences, there's always a silver lining. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In your experience, what did, how did you come out of it? And, and what was that silver lining for you? Probably took many years to unfold. I would say, I suppose. I'm <laughs> they're probably well, yeah moment. those kinds of processes i mean you know especially with a devastating loss like that yeah. we don't whether it's you know death divorce whatever it, it we think oh yeah wait, i can get through this really quick not yeah. the case because there's yeah. stuff right mm. <laughs> you got to process and and depending on your ability to process as to how long it's going to take mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and some of it you even think you've kind of processed everything and then it suddenly just pops up out of nowhere are and, you sure yeah, right. i'm still here you know so <laughs> um yeah i you know i mean i think uh yeah it affected me on a number of dimensions i suppose one was that that notion that nothing's really permanent in life you know i mean i had experienced loss of family members before grandparents and maybe some aunts, uncles kind of situation. But, um, you know, when you, when you lose a parent, someone that's that close to you, um, especially yeah. Especially in that manner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially in that manner. And at that age, that kind of transformative period of, you know, exiting adolescence, starting to emerge into young adulthood. Um, yeah, I suppose there were probably a lot of things that I didn't you know, I missed out on in terms of having that uh, male figure like that in my life, uh, not a stepfather, but um, it still, you know, creates an impact there. Sure. Um, and I'm going to ask you a really bizarre question because there yeah, are sure. those who do um, span the boundaries, I guess, for lack of a better. Um, were there, in your longing for his presence in your life, were there moments where you felt a connectedness or experienced a crossover between worlds or anything to that nature? Possibly early on, um, later in life. I don't know. I would kind of say I, I, I sort of doubt it. Um, you know, as a, as a young man in university, you you experiment, you do things with mm -hmm. chemicals and things that sometimes you have weird experiences that are difficult to explain and in hindsight. Um, but yeah, you know, definitely, you know, these kinds of moments of, you know, I don't know if it's connecting to something else out there, or if it's mm -hmm. just inner journey of, you know, the mind finding some way to, to heal the trauma that you've been through. Sure. Uh, but, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was transformative in a lot of ways. And I, I'd say, you know, really it was probably wasn't until my forties that I probably felt like I actually started to deal with a lot of it, you know, early on, it probably just manifested itself in, uh, doing dumb shit as a young adult. <laughs> oh, we don't um, do that, do we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Making stupid decisions, compartmentalizing feelings, things of that nature. Yeah. When I got to the, when I got to 39, I as I as I started to to kind of come up on it, I realized that I had this lingering feeling in the back of my head because my, my father had mental illness issues and um and that was the year that he that he killed himself. So when I finally got approaching that age myself it was kind of this sense of like waiting for the the other shoe to drop it's like oh, right it's like what's yeah. going to go on with me because there is yeah a, a potential and, genetic history exactly and you know i mean i'm certainly aware of the fact that it, it was a probably a component in you know some of the life decisions that i've made like mm -hmm. i don't have children um and that is in part due to the fact that I never wanted to put a child through what I went through, sure. um, you know, the reasons like I, even at 19, I was kind of not really sure the world was heading in a particularly great direction. Um, so I kind of wondered what the future was going to be like, but, um, but yeah, you know, when you look back on it and you, you see all the ways in which it's, it's had both negative and positive impacts. Like you, you mentioned the silver lining of, a few years ago, we had some close family friends who went through the same thing and it was it was a really unusual experience to be able to relive a little bit of that but not as a 17 year old 
as a 47 year old now who could offer some sort of counsel and you know compassion to the 17 year old boy who was going through that in that family um yeah it's and it's weird it's in it, it almost yeah, in some ways you kind of wonder like did I did I go through this just so that I could help other people a little bit you know to deal with what they have to go through themselves so and that is probably true right to some degree as we understand life paths and, and historical patterns and things like mm -hmm. that that we learn that we can then because our job is to love and be loved right and how do we do that well we have to go through the situations where we develop care and compassion for others mm -hmm. as well as mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. the reason i asked about the potential of um having that connection beyond this world if you will um we mentioned before you know living half inside and half outside we're kind of bereft of what's going on inside and in that inner side of things there's no boundaries yeah. right there's just consciousness there's that ability to connect and i found that for myself it, it started young as well that i seem to have this ability to communicate mm -hmm. with others and to the point where at one point i uh, had a friend of mine that had uh, had a motorcycle accident died in a motorcycle wreck and i was in my early 20s at the time had just moved to phoenix and, and grew up in indiana of course and um, we one night i was wondering if i could talk to him because we had, I had some friends over for dinner that knew him as well and we were talking about the the ability of people to transcend those boundaries and report right yeah. and so yeah. That conversation came up, so I went to bed thinking, you know, wow, can I, can I talk to him? And so I start calling out his name, nothing, nothing. And then I remember, oh, there's probably a, a lot of folks named Steve, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but he had a nickname, Blab. And yeah. so I, you know, called out, Blab, are you out there? Can you hear me? And all of a sudden, bing, right in the center of my vision was his face. And he says, my name, he says, is that you? <laughs> Bruce, I've, I've gone by Zen for a few decades, but uh, yeah. this is Bruce. Is that you? And I'm like, yeah, man, where are you at? And, and uh, or no, I said, I, I heard him and I said, um, as soon as that happened, my now ex-wife raised up off her pillow and says, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. Why? <laughs> right? Because I was completely <laughs> still yeah and she goes i just saw steve's face and i tried blinking my eyes and he wouldn't go away and at that point it was like okay here's some really dynamic proof and i had tears streaming down my face you know with, with that awe um and i said okay so it's been proven medically the body loses 21 grams of weight immediately upon cessation of life weight has mass mass has form can we see him with our eyes open mm -hmm. he goes, i don't know it scares me i'm going back to bed you do whatever you want <laughs> so I laid back down and, and I totally get it, right? Because that, that's kind of when you're dealing with the unknown, you don't know what's there. And, and it oh, yeah. strikes fear instead of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had the curiosity side. And I'm like, okay, Bob, man, can I see you? And this gray mist took form at the end of the bed. And this is in a dark room. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, here's his body. You're looking just like he did, flannel shirt, jeans, all that. He's like 6'4", six, 6'5". And uh, it, you know, it's like, wow, man, are, tell me, uh, can you travel with a thought? Was my first question. And I see trails going out of the room, trails coming back in the room. There he stands again. I said, you go back home, meaning Indiana. He said, yeah. And I'm like, oh man, we're freaking out. This is great. Now, <laughs> I know how powerful my mind can be. Am I projecting your image or are you actually there? And with mm -hmm. that question, I felt the sheets move on the end of the bed, the, the end of the bed move. I looked a little closer. His foot was on the end of the bed, had his elbow in his hand and uh, chin in his other hand and smiling at me like a chair. Cheshire cat says, how's that? <laughs> so what do you do with that? Yeah. And the energy was so intense. All I could do was get up, put some clothes on, take a walk for a couple hours mm -hmm. and talk to him. Mm -hmm. For some reason, he felt like, you know, there were some questions that he had that I could help answer because of my awakening that I'd had uh, as a teenager, which gave yeah. me access, evidently. 
Mm -hmm. And so those kinds of things, there are those who have those skill sets, I guess, for mm -hmm. lack of better, that are often really misunderstood and often, um, how can I put it, um, rejected by others. I'll put it that oh, way. Yeah. Or ridiculed in some way, you know. I mean, um, look, I remember the first conversation you and I ever had. And you were pretty open with me within about 20 or 25 minutes of what you've experienced in your life. And they were definitely the kind of things that a lot of people would just say, like, oh, what's this guy on about, you know? Yeah, what's he on, period. <laughs> or that, yeah. But it was, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it immensely I, uh, because I just listened to you, you know? I just wanted to be curious about kind of what you'd experienced. And I sort of have this belief myself that, like, um like i'm not really sh you know like you were saying about projection of the mind and and mm -hmm. i think in many ways life is a projection of the mind and you know i kind of wonder is there an objective reality that we really all share or is it just a, a bunch of overlapping projections you know that kind of make up a bit of of what we see there but it seems the, yes to both yeah and, and with what you were raising you know, I thought about it as well through the, the lens of like, okay, well, does does somebody believe this is real, tangible in the way that we tend to define that? Or is this, as you're describing here, or is this some figment of the imagination that's happened? And I kind of decided in the end, it, it really doesn't matter because like most of what we agree on as reality anyways is probably a projection <laughs> that most of us just happen to agree on. So like, what's the difference, you know? Exactly. Um, well, and how and I thought the great part of it though, sorry, I thought the great part of it though, was that at the base of everything you were talking about in the story was about love, acceptance, um, compassion, and like whether it's real or whether it's not, these are the kind of values and the kinds of things that I think we need more of in the world. So, so what's it really matter? <laughs> well, the curiosity and the compassion to explore it and to listen, be able to be present, listen to others, and, and just be open, yeah. right? Because each of us have a, have a different experience. And mm -hmm. as you're talking about the overlay, right, there's, from my experience and, and queries and things like that, and I'd like to ask you more about how this kind of fits into the work that you're doing now, mm -hmm. there seems to be this combination of genetic and solar, if you will, S-O-U-L, energy that combines that, according to the Vedantic philosophy, gives us the ability of having a perfected form, fit, and function in the world that's specific and unique to us individually, and yet fits in with all of the others in a harmonic framework mm -hmm. in that capacity to love and be loved as yeah. we you know peel back the layers to get to that place in ourselves first you gotta love yourself right you can't love anybody else till you do yeah fully yep. and then how you do that how how did you find in that process because i know there was as a teenager there was probably some <clears throat> reflections of guilt on your part as to what prompted your dad to do that how did you get through that what were what was the process that you went through and I'm sure it took a while, were there phases, were there layers, and did you notice what those were and the insights that you got in each of those increments? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if at the time I would have necessarily had the, the awareness or been viewing it in that sense to kind of realize what was happening and sure. well, it's too fresh. Oh, yeah, I was seeing, and even for probably, you know, a good 10, 15 years after that, you know, mm -hmm. um, as I look back on it now, I suppose there's, I don't know, there's sort of numerous aspects of it, I guess, that kind of stand out to me. I suppose one is who my partner in life is. Um, my my wife, my business partner, my best friend, she also, you know, lost her father at a, at a young age from cancer, completely different reasons. Mm. But, you know, we met um, 
damn near almost 30 years ago. And, you know, there's, there was something about having somebody who is like your companion on that journey through life that can identify with the stuff that you have experienced. That's just, you know, it's validating. It, it just lets you know, you're not alone, I suppose, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So there was probably a, a stage that I've, I suppose, unpacked later in my life that you know when you when you start to kind of emerge out of that self-centered aspect of adolescence and young adulthood and you start to realize there are other people in the world and they got their own freaking problems and everything doesn't revolve around you you know that, that helps you i think to reframe some of the narrative around this you know understand that you know any of those doubts that lingered from a young man's mind of of you know the guilt of not being there for him with some of the things that he was going through or whatever it might have been was like you were a kid man you didn't have the tools to deal with that um and it wasn't about you at all you know um, and yet we still carry that right oh yeah and this is part of that and i don't know i i would imagine it's a natural process because we want to care for those we love and mm -hmm. we often feel responsible for them in some way even mm -hmm. though we're not right yeah. they have their own lives to live and in, in their own process and however that works out it's um a, a bit challenging to be able to simply just see that and be able to step back from it because you're too entrenched in that mm -hmm. early on and you don't mm -hmm. as, as an adolescent like you were saying because the the world of water revolves around you at that time oh, yeah. you step back and realize that oh i revolve around the world yeah <laughs> completely different perspective yeah something even bigger really yeah yeah so yeah, how think... did that move into your the work that you do how your wife and, and you, you know, moved into this space of holistic thinking, first of all, mm -hmm. and how you brought that in and applied it to the work that you do and, and the folks that you serve. Yeah. Well, you know, I think before I answer that, one other thing I'd maybe just throw in there in terms of I think one of the things that kind of shaped what this journey has looked like is, uh, you know, if I'm honest and I'm really you know, look at myself through a critical lens, I think that some of that experience jaded me to connecting to parts of my family for a really long time, you know, uh, my, uh, my, my, my dad's brother had suggested some things that he was going to help me with when this all happened, which, uh, he, didn't really um, actually left a, a lot for for me to deal with, which uh, yeah, you know, kind of put me off. Like I've very few regrets in my life. One is that um, I didn't actually give him the opportunity to repair some of that a bit later in his own life when he you know he came back to me, kind of seeking to resolve some of it when I was probably in my mid thirties, and mm -hmm. and I just wasn't ready for it. You know, I think for a long time I probably I I, uh, I fell out of. I think being who I started to become as a young person into that world of just falling into the corporate machine, the blinders are up. How do I pay my debts? How do I build a future for myself? And, you know, you kind of get lost in it. Yeah. Uh, you, you get lost in the prescriptive narrative. Yeah. And then it all started to go quite well. I, you know, until I worked, it didn't yeah yeah i you know i i served for almost 18 years and uh one of the world's most successful or rapidly growing companies amazon um started when i really the idea of selling stuff on the internet i, when I first told my mom or this was my job she laughed at me she's like no one's ever going to give their credit card number to people to buy stuff on the internet what are you stupid um she didn't call me stupid i i that's yeah, a, yeah, that's, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. that's my own uh embellishment. In long way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but you know, when I get to the uh, I get towards the end of that journey and like things are going well for me, job's quite successful, I've got a big role here in Ireland, I've actually moved abroad. 
um, life is starting to become what, you know, we, we think it is. And, but then I started looking at it more closely and it just felt empty, you know, it was like, um, I would not see my wife for probably a good quarter of the year, just like getting everything ready for the Christmas rush. Um, and then we were suddenly going to do this thing called prime day, which was like basically having Christmas in July. So it was like, shit, man, like I'm already missing the person that means the most to me for the, the last portion of the year. And now you want me to do that to my summer too. And it's like, what am I, you know, what am I working towards? Like you, you start to feel owned by the things that you've worked to acquire. Uh, and I started thinking a lot more about, you know, my own legacy. Like, what was it? What did I want to, what I want to be known for? What did I want people to remember me for? And it certainly wasn't beaten last year's numbers sure. this year. Like you know, I so I think I fully. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about the my early introduction to learning how to use interpersonal skills. Yeah. You know, as a late or mid to late twenties, I was responsible for seven million dollars a month in shipments for eight hundred part numbers for a, a company now known as Honeywell. Mm -hmm. And oh, uh, guys. yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, and had the same thing happened you know it, it basically destroyed my life i was working anywhere from 55 to month in 75 mm -hmm. hours a week was not uncommon and so i was away from family it caused lots of things opportunities and eventually divorce and mm -hmm. now you know i've um, you know the, the regrets of not being there for your kids i had four kids that i really after i mean the oldest was nine the youngest was two and over the years, there's been virtually, you know, not no uh, interaction. However, the kinds of things I would have liked to have been able to be present for and share in and help them grow with never happened. And, uh, and I miss that still to this yeah. day. And, and the kids aren't doing all that well as a result either. And yeah. so... You know, being estranged is still, you know, what do you do as a father? Well, you try to be the best example, you know, that, and hope that someday they will look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, in, in many ways, I'm glad I didn't have kids because I, I could foresee the same kind of thing. I, I was watching it happen to many of my friends who were on the same career journey as I was so I, you know so, so to actually answer your question you know what what kind of drove me down the path that I'm on now I think it was some of it was experience you know like I worked for some people who you know made part of that experience of working there like the best work experience I'd ever had in my life you mm -hmm. know we were all kind of you know I, I'm remiss to say cut from the same cloth we were, we all operated off a shared mental model, you know, we were all different, but we had, we had something that, you know, allowed us to collaborate, to kind of unify us together around what we were trying to achieve. Um, it was exciting. It was innovative. It was fun. Like we had a lot of autonomy. Well, I know. had a blast too. I, I really yeah. enjoyed what I was doing. However, yeah. there was no being. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> when I looked at the rest of the organization, I realized that I was, I was kind of, you know, I had a bit of a unique thing going on. I was lucky to work with some of the people that I worked with. And I, I realized as well, like I, you know, I, I had a non-tech background in a big tech company. So being a principal engineer that's building the next beautiful thing that's going to, you know, advance the company forward really wasn't, that wasn't my thing. My thing was what you and I were talking about earlier, you know. I was described as glue and lubricant, you know, I mm -hmm. got people to bind together and made it easier for them to work together. I started to realize. It needs that, it, you know, that we call that facilitation, right? Yeah, absolutely. And to be able to step into that role, it, it's truly an art to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It, it's and like, I, you know, you are the rising tide. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I start. I mean, I started to realize, despite the power one may have had from a position of authority, the power that one had from a position of influence, um, which in my mind is 
loads better. <laughs> it's got a much longer shelf life. Uh, it's a much easier pill to swallow. Um, but you don't have, yeah. there's no regrets that way. There's no malevolence. Exactly. You're always looking for the best thing to do. And then like for me, you know, it was, um, I ended up at the top of the production group in a 35 person department because mm -hmm. of the way I treated people. You just treat yeah. people with respect, you know, like they <laughs> treat them like you would want to be treated. Golden rule kind of stuff, right? It's not yeah. that difficult. Yeah. And yet, when you're in those kinds of environments, you're scared of making mistakes. So you tend to want to control everything around you, which is a common feature. Totally. And I think that's kind of, yeah, we've, we've almost like wrapped up the last six years for me <laughs> in a little bit of a bow there because like I... I realized it was like, okay, actually I'm good at this and I like doing it. And as it turns out, people will pay you to do this by mm -hmm. unbeknownst to me, you know? Um, so kind of pursued a career in coaching, um, getting in, you know, involved in rapidly growing organizations, doing a lot of work around talent because I really think that people are the, they're, they're the, they're the make or break for your, your company your organization whatever it might be yeah. because... anything that we do whatever whether it's a service or a product or manufacturing it, it doesn't matter it's people that yep. are in the process that do the work Absolutely. and so how do you get them what have you found are, are some of the keys of moving people into a place of their own empowered doing yeah i think a lot of it starts with how leaders show up themselves and i think where our work has kind of gone over the last several years is realizing that you know it started in this place of hey let's take some of these great ways of doing things great ways of thinking about things that that we that we experienced at amazon bring them into other organizations obviously in a way that's fit for them um but we started to realize over over time as well that it's like there's, there's a whole other layer to this stuff that's beyond just like this management stuff and leadership stuff that a lot of people really talk about mm -hmm. and that's where we kind of get into you know you when you introduced me you mentioned vertical development consultant and when we're talking about vertical really what we're talking about is like the you know the level of awareness from through from which we understand the world around us and, you know, we kind of progress through these stair steps, if you will, uh, as we evolve, as we grow ourselves and the prevailing world is kind of stuck at a level I'd call, we'd call achievist, you know, it's all about what you see in most organizations, how we hit those targets this month or this quarter winning, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. And it's, it's ignoring what you were you were kind of pointing out a minute ago. It's all about people, and it's really everything. Our organization, the community, the environment that we work in—it's it's systems all the way up and down, man. Everything is connected to everything else, and the and, big system being a holistic one. Yeah, and once you start seeing it in that way, as opposed to it's a pyramid, I'm at the top. It's about the hierarchy. It's about command and controlling everything. Like I think this is why people are miserable in work today. I think those of us <laughs> who are in management are so far abstracted away from the stuff that's actually being done, yet we have this belief and expectation that we need to control, make all these decisions and everything else. Like we've 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 created this like horrible situation for ourselves. Before we got on the call, you were describing a, a building that was an inverted pyramid, which is very much more the way that I try to get people to think about it. It's it's like, the, the, you know, the actions, like, let's flip it on its head, you know. The people at the action, closer to the action, have a better sense of what's going on most of the time. We don't need to be making all the decisions up here. How do we empower them down there? And I think the way that you do a lot of this is... Uh, through the kind of behaviors that you embed into the culture that like you reward, that you foster, you know, the kind of values, so to speak, that might, uh, that are going to be the things that you care about. Right. So a lot of good companies do this, you know, what's our purpose? They acknowledge, they honor, they, they yeah. do, they celebrate. And, yeah. you know, that inverted pyramid is very much what we call a servant leadership model yeah. now, yeah. And, yeah. as opposed to the hierarchical. And by being able to do that, um, especially coming out of, of this last kerfuffle, 
distribution of the workforce now there's a lot of remote working and people going hey you know i don't like the company i was working for because of those very things we're talking about mm -hmm. right they're just the the cohesion wasn't there mm -hmm. at those yeah. upper levels you know because you never leave a company because you don't like the work it's usually you don't like your boss typically <laughs> yeah yeah and, and yeah usually so in the servant leadership style you know there's this uh, and my most recent book is about the emerging holistic growth and it's subtitled the servant leaders guide which talks about this new way of perceiving of being of sensing you know mm -hmm. we can't think our way through a system built on vibration we know the system is a, is a vibratory one now because of quantum physics yep we must feel our way through that now well how do we do that what models are present though that encapsulates that process and allows us to do it one of the great ones is the theory you model that uh Otto Sharma and Peter Senge put together for the MIT process absolutely yeah so, I think another good one would be you know like David Bohm like dial dialogue you know that's yeah. like a it's a pretty simple well, imagine that uh, let's talk to idea. each other <laughs> right? let's have an yeah. open discussion yeah so right. you know i mean uh, it might sound kind of silly but in a lot of ways that's where a lot of the work leads is is you know absolutely being a leader isn't isn't showing up and you know commanding this it's showing up uh self-management first because the, you know your company culture isn't going to be these programs that you create or whatever inclusion groups or whatnot it's it's the behaviors that everybody shows up with every day and you as the leader are going to drive a lot of that so that's like the first place to begin management of self how we how we how we show up in the environment but um yeah beyond that i mean it's it's getting people to kind of start to shift into that quantum way of thinking to kind of realize that you are never going to have anything better than a partial perspective you don't know the ultimate truth like in nearly any situation you know sure. everybody's got a different view of it everybody's got a, their own reality tunnel that they're existing in um, and as that facilitator then in a leadership role your job is essentially it's like you're the hub of the wheel right yeah. where you're yeah. looking around you're asking for all those through open dialogue investigative curious uh vulnerable even right mm -hmm. which you have to lead so you have to share yourself as an open vulnerable inclusive individual and you can't fake it no right because that's something that can be felt as well as mm -hmm. seen Absolutely. and then you work on bringing all those different different perspectives to bear on a single mission vision goal mm -hmm. project mm -hmm could be a family even yeah because it could applies be. across the board this is just a good way to evolve together yeah and i and i think the imperative is greater than ever like you know if you if you just think about the trajectory of humanity and work over the last twenty thousand years let's say hmm. you know, we've, we've started from this agrarian you know hunter-gatherer small tribal sort of communities to you know technology and things happen that allow us to 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 form larger kind of groups highly specialized yeah you know we we've the the agricultural revolution the industrial revolution that, that change what work look like over time change the maladies that are associated with work as well you know our backs weren't uh breaking from bending over in the fields all day long in the 1870s or, or coughing 80s. out of turn yeah you know or, yeah exactly <laughs> or uh you know uh that we traded that in for black lung working in mines and you know heavy industry and 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 as you know the information uh revolution has, has come along as well and and computing has made you know mobile phones ubiquitous to the majority mm -hmm. of the global population we find ourselves at a time where i think you have more people than ever before operating from a different level of awareness you know i was i was watching something here recently about uh, a rural community in ireland about you know 100 years uh about 150 years ago because it was well it would have been a little bit more than that because it was uh before the the famine okay. um and 
you know, they were describing, you know, what these people's lives was like, how much, you know, how much of a worldview they would have had, you know, they would have only known like what was happening in a, a radius of, a, you know, a, a fairly small size. Now you have people that, you know, at a very young age, they have friends on the other side of the globe. Um, they can actually identify with and understand what someone who would have long been considered the other or a foreigner might mm -hmm. be. You know, we don't we don't see the world through a lens like this anymore. We see the world through a lens like this. I, Yet when we go to work, most of us still work in organizations that are kind of born out of you know thinking that's come from the 1950s to you know the, maybe the early mm -hmm. 2000s. Um, and I think that that's, you know, when you go back to that system's view of everything, I think all this evidence we see of, you know, quiet quitting and people don't want to work and, you know, it's companies that are having to try to force people to go back to the office, like we've evolved past this, like the organizations are either going to catch up or they're just going to wither and die because I think there will be other ones that will come along that are going to be, cut from that cloth that, you know, you and I have talked about D Hawk before the, uh, CEO, uh, and founder of Visa, which is a fantastic story of, of how that came about. Great book to read. If no one oh, ever read wow. it. Okay. It's about chaotic organizations, you know, well, that was like, a very uh, serendipitous synchronistic <laughs> mention. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. When you said it earlier, I was like, oh, either you remembered something we talked about before, or we're just like jiving there together. But, uh, you know, yeah, I think I mean, that like, that's the case. If I may, that we are so interconnected in the thought sphere there because, you know, we're physical beings. We think we are, but yet we know we're just energy. All right. right. So that, that energy has access, then the transmission of thoughts, especially where two or more are gathered in that same energy, yeah. that there's this openness, there's this synchronistic capacity yeah. for putting in all of these different things and, and recognizing like the D Hawk reference, right? That, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're much more connected than we thought we might've been mm -hmm. right? simply yeah. because we're talking about stuff. And so it yep. gets that opportunity <laughs> for you know to to take place. Now, how do you see this? Um, first of all, do you see that there? Granted, we've made in, industrially, we've had this evolution from, let's say, almost a feudal system up to um, a corporatocracy now, or perhaps um, even a techno feudal system with the ecosystem that a lot of these big tech companies have created yeah now do you see any other things that are evidence of a progression that and along with it so it's a twofold question do you see the progression from other perspectives not just the what we're talking about and that your curiosity or questions about that process are showing up with answers as you kind of like uh, Renee Wilkie says, you know, you can't, you can't, and even Einstein says, you can't solve problems with the same thinking that creates it. You got to ask yeah. the question and live the answer because life will provide it. Mm -hmm. So has that been, do you see evidence of that in your own life of, of how uh, seemingly different themes throughout history are beginning to coalesce toward a, a a goal of possible even harmony among people and planet. Well, I mean, I I sure kind of hope so. I mean, <laughs> you know, I like I sort of feel like I sort of feel like we're at the the pendulum swing back from the movement towards globalization and centralization of everything. Mm -hmm. So I think as you look at you know as you look at things that are happening around. Uh, planetary concerns like the climate crisis or however you want to label that. Um, to me, that's one of these areas in which it forces that evolution of thinking and how we organize ourselves because like you can't, you're, we're not going to, you know, it's exactly that transcending to another level of solving problem because we won't solve this from a national point of view. Or even a human centric point of view. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, because Which is really where we see, you know, that's the lens that we see everything from currently. And there's Absolutely. Yeah. evidently a bit more than that because we're just one item and a bunch of people in space on a spinning mm -hmm. ball that mm -hmm. has its own process that we're unaware of. Oh, yeah. That have history through the study of the ice cores, right? We know mm -hmm. the changes and what happened over millennia. And mm -hmm. yet, seemingly in this period, it's all being truncated. Um, I heard, actually read uh, um, some evidence from a source not from here. And, uh, and it was offered by a gentleman that uh, seems Wilbert Smith. He ran Canada's um, Project Magnet, which was like the United States Blue Book, right? Mm -hmm. Study of UFOs. I, I know that yeah. that kind of leaped off the... The precipice here however uh, very astute scientists kept records kept memoirs they were uh, he passed in 62 they were published in 64 and some of them contain conversations that he had with non-human intelligence some of which they imparted some really cool tasty tidbits of transcendent information such as time to them is a measurement in the change of entropy mm. Yeah. So sitting with that for just a little bit, how would this transition look as we approach more cohesion and harmony in the process and the people involved? Yeah. It would, in, in a sense, truncate the time frame necessary for those changes to take place in theory. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, I think all of the, it feels like every day I'm reading some new advancements in quantum physics as well, which, you know, it, it aims to close this gap of understanding that we seem to have around even such basic things as like consciousness, like how does this happen? Where's well, this the inner and outer bridge, right? The, yeah. the inner being the energy, the the outer being the, the, the seeming physicality. And how do you bridge those two? How do you find your way, your perfected way? Or uh, that sounds a little too promiscuous uh, or projective. Um, promiscuous? I don't know. Maybe that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sample like everything. That one. Right? Um, what we, and don't we have to sample everything? We have to be open to an entire new array of possibilities in order to coagulate something that actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then how do we make sense common with that new information? Because it, there's an educational process that has to take place to, re, to alleviate the old belief systems that were separative yeah. and include the ones and, and maybe even experience systems rather than belief systems of how the science and spirituality combine to create a, a unified field mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right yeah and that feels like uh yeah there's going to be a a fair amount of fear and resistance i would suspect associated with that so um, new. yeah anything unknown yeah. is going to have some resistance to it. it's like oh i don't know it, it feels like this is the way i go but it's so new i, I don't know i'm so used to this mm -hmm. right now do i have to let this go do i lose my individuality do i lose my identity in this am i going to become a number in a system and you know completely lose sight of my own being and i, I think that's probably the main fear and yet when you step into it, you begin to act as if and, and behave in such a way that you're open, honest, authentic, caring, compassionate. All of these things bring together a, a completely different experience than what you thought you might have had. And we oh, yeah. go back to that, yeah, 99% of your fears will never manifest because you all mm -hmm. create them in your head. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a... You know, I mean, I, f I feel like what we're talking about, you know, in terms of like seeing things from a, an enlightened position, shall we say, is, you know, still very much a continuing journey for me. But just the sense of where I'm at on it now and 
the the former feelings of scarcity that would have driven those kinds of fears that you're talking about versus now operating more from a place of abundance mm -hmm. where you know a lot of that fear just is kind of out the door you know it's like huh? is it possible that we have everything that we need that all the systems in place were designed by maybe even a greater intelligence just that filtered through us that then come to a state of being able to coalesce with a different mind flow if you will rather than you know the prescriptive notions that bring it together in service to mm -hmm. all of us rather than in the the separative notions yeah. of it well that's you know certainly the place that i'm trying to operate from you know i mean i you know a big part of the work we do i suppose is like i belief that you know business is more than just a way to make money you know like it's a way to improve the world around us and raise quality of life for you know everyone and everything to some extent um so you're seeing a shift from an old agenda of profit over people and planet to people and planet over profit now yeah definitely i i you know i think i think uh you know it's hard to distinguish sometimes when something's been there and you just weren't seeing it versus <laughs> it's everywhere now because you're looking out for it but yeah, uh yeah. i mean certainly you know at the at the beginning as i as i kind of mentioned earlier oh, look at the pink elephant yeah yeah we you know we were we were much more about that high performance kind of thing and i think we've you know we've over time fallen more into the authentic place of mm -hmm. that that triple bottom line kind of thing and i think that the other people that resonates with you know they're they're attracted to us you know mm -hmm. as you mentioned before that sort of synchronicity and um, there's a lot of discovery and you know books being written uh even you know, a couple of decades ago, there was an uh, author that his name's Dudley Lynch. He actually gave me the possibilities coagulator moniker that I <laughs> He wrote a book called Strategy of the Dolphin back in the 80s. It was an OD book, Organizational Development. And then his next book was called The Mother of All Minds. And in it, he had a very particular view that okay we've got the alpha mind and the alpha chassis the alpha mind steeped in competition right so that's how we behaved yeah the new being coming becoming present has a beta mind still the alpha chassis because their bodies really haven't changed all the much although they're they are in process as we're moving closer to this beta mind notion mm -hmm. which understands that maybe not fully understands but at least can theorize the concept of oneness mm -hmm. which is the opposite of competition it's collaborative yep. right everything's working together in harmony it doesn't necessarily harmony doesn't necessarily mean that chaos is not present because mm -hmm. working through those chaotic moments is where we grow and we all yeah. have them where we have that moment where we have to make choices mm -hmm. right do i feel do i think do i take action do i sit still and be more curious and i think the latter is what's beginning to happen I, uh and you, i'm sure you're familiar with the, the new phrase is like go slow to go fast oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> unpack that a little bit what's that mean to you and and in, in reference to our conversation and what we're talking about as far as the growth and maturity of the planetary well, civilization if you will i think what it kind of what i take away from it is like you know life's not a game to be won and there's not like a finish line that we're like going towards mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i suppose i i i just kind of see it as this experience to be had um and and i know when i started thinking of it in a different context like that the actions the choices you take become radically different you know um i'm not you know i'm 
you know, as a, as a small business entrepreneur, you know, if I'm not constantly out looking, you know, driving new clients and new business in, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, the business didn't seem like it was going anywhere. I've kind of gotten to a certain point as I've grown a little older, a little wiser, think about that systemic nature of things like. Sure. And, and you realize the full things. energy that, yeah. that is present in that. So how do you find flow? What's that like? Is that part of what going slow allows you to step into? and be more conscious of and even through your activities magnetizing those perfect clients to show up rather than you go out and have to hunt yeah absolutely um i i think that we end up getting ourselves so busy with a lot of stuff that really doesn't doesn't really help us go anywhere that you were talking about the inside and outside earlier. We just do all this outside work and the inside, as you mentioned, is just kind of empty. Um, I think that going, for me at least, over the last year especially, that going slower pace has given me uh, an opportunity to observe a bit more of my own life, to be curious about some of the things that drive me, to challenge some of that programming that, you know, ends up being the dominant thing that's running in our minds most of the time is that uh, the sense driven is that something you feel as you're going through this process that there's a lack of resonance <laughs> yeah i i think you know for me also, is it a feeling or a thinking thing right yeah it was, you know, we it talk was, about the indigenous cultures and the three brain yeah. system we got the heart and the head oh, right yeah processing yep. that way as opposed to how we're used to processing which is not including our bodies at all absolutely yeah and i think that was a probably a, a larger shift for me i would have for the majority of my life been largely driven by this one um, i think we all are yeah we're not taught but, about the inner life we're not taught about the sensitivity that we need and and now quantum physics like i said is exposing all this stuff as energy well how you know how do we sense that how do we move with it how do we dance and, and you know instead of being about like a you know ship on an ocean <laughs> yeah and i think for me i got to a point where yeah it felt like dissonance it was like here's what i want to be doing here's how it's manifesting as i'm going in and working with people this was this was all kind of last summer as you know, a lot of big tech companies are going through massive cuts and, and everything mm -hmm. else and kind of step back and you look at this and you're like, not sure all of this is really driven by financial motivations of the organization themselves and things that they need to do versus things that other people might be suggesting that they need to do because that's what's happening in the market or that's what investors want. You start to kind of, I don't know, for me, there was, there was a, yeah, there was just a, it just wasn't, I felt like I was forcing something. Mm. Um, and so I just kind of had to step away from it all for a while, spent some time just looking inward, writing, getting some of my thoughts out, kind of finding a bit of a cogent idea in all these fleeting things that are kind of bouncing around sure. um, until, yeah, you kind of find something that do did feel right, that felt like, okay, this... This makes sense to me this resonates with me this is this is a new reality that i've kind of constructed for myself that gives meaning to where i'm at now that um you know redefines what success looks like that acknowledges the fact that i a living being like everything else on this planet i don't run like this all the time like a like a stock price graph I, mm -hmm. I look like the seasons. I got an energy that goes up and goes We've down. We've all got biorhythms. Right? Yeah. And, you know, like acknowledging that and just like allowing that to happen uh, was huge in terms of not feeling like you're forcing something, not feeling like you're pushing beyond where you can at that moment, you know. Mm -hmm. And then some of it's, you know, having belief in that abundance that i need to look after myself right now and uh i'm gonna go quiet go dark for a while do some of the inner work i'll be back you know and i'll be back better than ever 
um, until the next time that I decide that <laughs> the energy is ebbing uh, and flowing. Well, you pay attention to it, right? Yeah. Most of us don't. We try to push our way through or get pulled mm -hmm. by something that we think we're needing to acquire or, or something yeah. needing to be. Right. Uh, yeah. And so we forget about that aspect of flow that, as you say, when you do go dark for a while, maybe learn how to dance with your shadow too, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to be That's playing cool. in the dark, this might as well, right? Because oh, yeah. it's part of you, and then you can learn how to embrace that. And then you come back with a much more complete being. And, you know, historically, we don't explore that. We've got this body that's an instrument. We don't know how, you know, we just barely scratch the surface in understanding how it works. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the training or training exists. It's just not all that present because it's been in a different form that hasn't been readily understandable because it's experiential instead of book driven, mm -hmm. which is a lot of, of how we acquire skills, right? We, we read directions, <laughs> we read instructions and we go do or we're trained or, or something like that um, in, in the activity. Yet there's this emerging desire, I think, to know more, be more. Uh, one of the other books that I wrote called Zero to One, Making Our Way Toward a Conscious Civilization. I talk about this holistic system that we have and, and even just briefly address the chakras, the meridians, the marmas, as those are existing systems within the body that are all energetic, mm -hmm. that are historically strewn in different cultures. So how do we bring all of those into a holistic picture that we can then explore better, learn how to operate because we're asking, okay, how does this work? Mm -hmm. Why does it work? Mm -hmm. And then how can I take this understanding and be more present with it and operational, functional in this new living awareness that's emerging collectively. Yeah. Well, and I, I think you hit something on the head there too that's uh, a big differentiator, I suppose, in, in kind of like moving into this place is that you, you're talking about just understanding this better, using it better. You're not talking about an attachment to a specific outcome you know mm -hmm. and i think that's been one of the other big shifts is you know we live in a world right now that so you want to create a business you know the, the outcome driven yeah the prevailing model is kind of you come up with some idea you raise a bunch of money for it you build the thing you get it really big do a huge land grab probably lose money for a long time and then you know and then you become a billionaire you know right and right. that's that's really that's the dream yeah well it's also a false narrative you know it's a mm -hmm. it's a few companies that may have done that many others that have tried and failed um and i think the moment that we start so do we we do we look some of those attachments and some of those objectives like you know i used to like last summer when i kind of went into the you know not feeling so great you know part of it was a sense of well i i, I didn't succeed at what i was trying to do with this organization i was working with i've kind of had to just reframe some of these things to realize that well yeah sure maybe maybe i didn't do everything i wanted to but i see myself as a little bit of like a johnny appleseed now mm -hmm. um for those who don't know johnny appleseed he's a mythical american character maybe he's real uh, but he, he just wandered around the country countryside throwing apple seeds everywhere and apple trees would spring up and you know and there'd be apples for people to eat so i just kind of feel like Maybe that's maybe that's a better way of seeing things is like I'm I'm planting seeds and some of what I'm doing, some sure. of them will spring up really quickly. Some of them might take 10 or 20 years before they they bear any fruit. But you know, seeing things on that different that different timeline, you know, rethinking what time looks like as you were kind of discussing. Because you're not attached to the outcome, you can step into the now and do what's present as yeah. opposed to being in a future or you know, looking at the past mm -hmm. and being caught up in those two places, which are diminished energy when you're in the present. Yeah, or um, anxiety and depression, usually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So why do we want that, right? Do you think that as we're talking about these business models, and, and I agree they are present, and, and this is where everybody's striving to do and, and be. Yeah. However, is there... 
uh, maybe a perspective that in looking at this, what we're seeing as successes are actually anomalies and that there's something better that's more effective and efficient that we aren't looking at because you've got these, you know, verticals that they're rare, right? Yeah. They do happen. It shows that, yeah, we can, this can be accomplished. And yet, why is it for such a few? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I kind of I kind of have this feeling, or well, I, I sort of have maybe this radical, dreamy idea that like we, we have with the creation of business completely backwards. So just like the just like we we're talking about with servant leadership earlier and inverting the pyramid, you know, typically business starts with really good idea that we want to do. And then we build around it and we build a wonderful culture around it. You know, that's almost this familial kind of culture in nature that, uh, you know, what a lot of organizations are pretty good at doing these days, um, until, you know, things get tough and at the heart of the, the thing that you're trying to do is still this commercial objective. Mm -hmm. So suddenly people aren't part of the family anymore. You know, they're cut out of it for some reason or another. Um, which I think short-term and long-term undermines everything you're trying to do culturally, you know, it's oh, absolutely it's right. totally it's a dysfunctional system. family at that point, yeah. lots of divorces, lots of deaths, you know, yeah. Separation, um, anxiety, who are we going to throw into the bus? So I, so I kind of wonder, should, do we have it backwards? Like, should we not start not from the commercial objective that we have, but the, the purpose that we have in terms of how we want to make the world better and the those come common... together as a collective saying okay what can we do given all the skill sets yeah. we have mm -hmm. what can we do given the skill sets that we can bring together and utilize in order to achieve something of benefit mm -hmm. now i don't know if they're the you know i'm sure there are people who know the the story better than i do who would be able to poke holes in in the example that i'm going to offer but you know I'll offer the mozilla foundation as maybe an example mm -hmm. mozilla foundation is a group of people that kind of believe a common view of the internet in terms of freedom safety security access for everybody um and out of that has spun some commercial products like the firefox web browser and the thunderbird mail client and some other things mm -hmm. i think when you start from that place of we have a common thing you know purpose that we want to serve values maybe that help to guide our community when you start to face difficulties you make different decisions than you do when the commercial thing is at the heart of everything that you want to do. So there are some great stories of some other organizations that, you know, when, when times got hard, they didn't cut 25% of the workforce. You know, everybody took a 25% pay cut or, you know, they didn't work on Fridays or something else was done that, you know, allowed the people who were part of the, the community, the organization to kept it whole. thrive and flourish. And yes, kept it whole. So... So, yeah, so I don't know, I'm kind of kicking the tires on this one lately of like, I think this is how the future looks like, you know, and, 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 the, and another, and I also would, I would, I would take a few pages out of this one for anyone who's never read this one before. Um, he, you know, this, this story is part um, sci-fi, part real reality. It's, it's a little bit of like, we get to the uh, 2008 financial crisis and uh, a guy built a portal that goes into another dimension and mm -hmm. people see that the world takes a different path. You know, we start to do things differently rather than austerity that we had for, you know, all of these countries in Europe after um, the, the bank bailouts that we did in, uh, mm -hmm. in 2009. Um, we saw these new types of organizations spin up. We saw the, uh, you know, this one voice, one share, one vote kind of, uh, what's he calling anarcho corpo syndicalists or something like that I, I, I got the wrong i got the word wrong well it but... is it, in a sense it's anarchy as i see it right self-directed yep right well when you're in that place of the big s self <laughs> not the little s but in the big s the anarchy is okay you see what needs to be done and you go do it and it's a collective operation as opposed to 
others, you know, thinking that, oh, that's just going to be chaos. No, that it's, it's the emerging inner directed um, sense of togetherness that we've been lacking that I believe COVID gave us the opportunity to create silver lining of. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I was super hopeful that the pandemic was going to rip this uh, open a little bit more than it did. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's sad. And it's, it's disappointing to see so many organizations um, Bill. flipping back to, you know, Hey, we, we said you could work from anywhere, but actually we're going to bring you back into the office. And, uh, you know, I think, um, see how it works out for him. One of the points <laughs> uh, Schwab made in his book, uh, he had two questions that I remember distinctly. One was to the individual, can we be carrying compassion, compassionate towards each other coming out of pandemic? And for businesses, can they be agile enough? Yeah. Yeah. Because if they're not, they're going to fall apart. It'll take a while. So mm -hmm. what's this agility about? And I think that's kind of what we're talking about is there's this sense of, okay, there's something new that needs to be present that hasn't been. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it has been. It's just been in select, kind of like in the civilization development, right? There's pockets here and there. Well, now how can we bring those pockets together and share ubiquitously in a new living awareness and potentially a real new world order that's mm -hmm. driven? that and it's driven to the extent of creating or co-creating harmony among people and planet is yeah. that such a bad thing right no not at all I exactly mean, maybe for those who are entrenched in a position of power but hopefully they realize they're just they're just, it's still because just of fear continue of to hang on by less and less you know so right it, isn't it still because of a fear of loss of that power and control well, if that ease, if you ease up on that just a little bit and you help support these things that are coming up, then you're not going to lose anything. Yeah. Right? Because it's your life that you want to be, you want to love, be loved, and feel comfortable in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's, uh, we're remarkably all quite similar in that way. So. That goes deep. So we've been at this for <laughs> a long time this is a wonderful conversation jeff i i really appreciate how you've been present and, and uh, conversing in it what would you you know given all of this how would you frame a, a curious question or maybe a piece of advice for others in their own progression hmm. and taking this in, into their own lives and being more present and, and responsible in their worlds yeah, it's a good question. I thought about this one a little bit. Uh, I, I suppose there are probably a few points that have came up in our discussion already today, but I mm. think for me they were they were big ones. You know, um, that realization first of all that we all we're just we're in a bigger system. Everything is within a system, within another system. You know, we are our own little systems as well, and it's like. Uh, the sooner I think we kind of realize that and realize that the universe is like way too complex to control or understand. <laughs> mm. And the more that we lean into that sense, respond, flow with it, like um, we, we can, we can, we can really make life a lot easier for ourselves. Um, which, you know, probably leads to the next one, which I, I mentioned earlier, like you're never going to have anything better than a partial view of reality of a given situation of an, of an event um and uh, you know so continuing to remain open to being able to expand and add to that view you know that's like that's kind of how I'm, i feel like i'm always showing up in that work context with people um the older i get the more i doubt that uh that objective reality exists <laughs> and i think the uh, for me i guess the last one is is really it's just about simplifying honestly man i think that We've overcomplicated our lives so much. We we bought into this myth that technology will save and ease everything for us. And sure, it's it's made a lot of things easier, but it's also created a lot of quagmires for us. I think the more that we can, you know, adopt a slightly minimalistic approach, I think the more that like joy and beauty and kind of experiencing this like short, precious time we have here in this form, it's just a little bit easier. 
So, cool. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for having the conversation. I, I appreciate your insights and wisdom and, and the depth of vision that you have in, in your own peering into things. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Zen. Valuable um, perspective. Always great to uh, bounce ideas off of you. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity and the invitation. Uh, you're very welcome. And namaste and in la catch. And thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefield, and I will see you next time. <laughs>